The COVID-19 pandemic has led to the dramatic loss of human lives worldwide. It has disproportionately impacted racial and ethnic minorities with an increased risk of infection, hospitalization and death. Yet, vaccination rates among African, Caribbean and Black individuals trail behind other racial groups despite significant improvements in vaccine optic within these communities we seek to understand the reason behind vaccine hesitation in Scotland's African, Caribbean and Black communities. We have in the UK, for all four countries, we have a thing called the Joint Committee on Vaccination. And that's a group of immunologists, ethicists, public health leaders who for decades have decided what the advice should be about vaccination of measles, of smallpox, of COVID, of flu, for the country. And that group of clinicians, not political, not uh, engaged with the drug companies, just entirely independent, and they give the governments of the UK, all four governments of the UK, independent advice about what to do with vaccination. So when the COVID vaccine was developed, they met, and they met repeatedly to say, what does the research say? What, is, what are the trials saying? What's the disease? How good is the vaccine? Who should we give it to? If we only have X number of doses, who should get it first? If we have 5 million doses, who should get it next? And in what order should we do that? So the Joint Committee has given us fantastic advice over the last 18 months. And vaccines are about risk reduction. Thank you so much, everyone, for turning up to this um, research and this discussion um, today. Um, and we're just, yeah, we're just happy to have you all here and to have this conversation, to have we don't usually get the opportunity to have this kind of discussion and to also be able to ask questions as well. Today we're bringing together African and Caribbean members of the community to discuss the COVID in terms of understanding their experience of the early days of COVID, understanding the experience of the vaccine, either they've taken it or not, but really just understanding the concerns and what do they want for the future. Over the past few years, COVID and COVID vaccination has uh, been our challenge and it's definitely been one of the, the biggest challenges in immunisation to date. Well, you can't have a fixed strategy in the face of a new global pandemic with a novel virus. You, you have to be agile. You have to be able to change as you learn more. And we've been through a number of phases in Scotland, in the UK and all around the world. Every country has had to adjust. Initially, that was to suppress the virus as low as we could. And we did that, unfortunately, with lockdowns, with keeping people at home, stopping people contacting each other, keeping people uh, away from school and away from large buildings like this. It was horrible, horrible. When this COVID thing started, at first we thought it was a joke. Before you know it, it spreads. Before you know it, it was no longer funny. When we see that people were dying in thousands, and we've been stuck at home. I got four boys, all boys with me at home. They became bored. My only social gathering is probably my church. And because I get to go to church like three, four times a week, and that is when I see people. So it was very, very daunting, not being, not being able to interact with friends. Oh, what I want to hear, Mom, is that how we're going to leave? Mom, we want to go out, you know? There are schoolwork. I have to be there doing, become the teacher. Even when I don't even know what to do at the internet at the at first, you know, I have to be calling the school all the time. With the isolate, sure. You understand? Okay, if you come in contact with someone that has COVID, even if you test negative, um, you still have to isolate for certain days. And that really puts um, a lot of financial strains 
on people the kids are at home they eat 24 hours they are the fridge is always open every five five seconds you know you can't stop that yeah. then i realize that when they go to school is a big help a lot of africans i think what people don't get is not all of us have access to social funds a lot of people don't um you you see it boldly written on um the visas no recourse to public funds and when you have to isolate and you work zero hours contract, that means there's no money coming in from the other end. In the area of mental health, at the point, I myself almost go crazy. You get to a point, I could not take it myself. I could not even take it. I go to work. They, when I get to work, they'll tell you, do tests. I'll do tests in the morning. Then uh, when I come back tomorrow, I'll do another test. I'll do any chest test, do a uh, lateral flow, do... Just, just every minute, every second. It wasn't really, really easy to be frank. I happened to be part of um, the welfare team in my in my church. People come to you with um, various needs from time to time, and in January last year, we had a few um, students who had just come in before COVID eat. Some of them don't even have their NI and they started schooling from home. The most impact that I had with COVID was kind of the way that it affected my schooling life and my, you know, my mental health uh, side of things. The, the worst one was um, when I had about um, a student who attempted suicide because they felt very, very isolated. School was giving them so much pressure to offset their bills. They can't even feed themselves, not to talk of paying their tuition. Most people can relate with the fact that COVID has been incredibly isolating. Especially as a university student, a lot of my friends are internationals. When you no longer meet and interact with those people, especially you know if you aren't maybe very adept at keeping on touch online, your relationships with them can very quickly weaken and you can end up in a position where you feel quite alone. You feel quite alone in walking through this new time which you're having difficulty navigating. And then you have difficulty asking for help. Not just your grade slip, your, your attendance slips, your all of that slip, and that's the academic side, but. Also in the personal slide, you're, you're no longer showing up to your personal relationships. You're no longer following through on things that you said that you, you'd do, that you knew that you would enjoy you'd do. And you find yourself where you feel very cut off for everyone and you're no longer performing or doing what you feel defines you as a person. And now I'm at this place, you know, I wasn't a student uh, that I'm no longer that. If you look at the first wave and you look at rates of hospitalisation and death, and you look at those in the, the Black, African or Caribbean group compared to the, the white population group in the first wave, the rates were one and a half times higher in that black African Caribbean group. In the second wave, it was twice as high. In the third wave, it was three times as high. And, and that's really had devastating consequences for people. The last CNN program, it showed the, the doctors and medical staff who had died. And I still remember, I still in my memory, Looking at the picture, I think there were about 50 people and a lot of the faces were black, you know. And I remember thinking, what's going on here? How is it possible that, you know, it's mostly black people who are dying? It was of great concern. I've been involved with a variety of aspects of COVID-19 research uh, in the last few years. One of these uh, aspects has been running the vaccine trials in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. So I've been the principal investigator 
locally for the local population in Glasgow and Clyde, um, for the Oxford vaccine trial, for the Novavax vaccine, for Valneva, um, and for booster vaccines. So there's a, a, a trial called Cough Boost, which is all about giving people a third or a fourth dose of vaccination uh, with some of the other vaccines, including Moderna and Pfizer. So we've really worked with all of the available vaccines in Glasgow. The global scientific community managed remarkably to get us a very effective vaccine quite quickly. So that allows you to change your tactics. That allows you to think, okay, now we can protect people scientifically. We can allow them to go back to the football games. We can let them go back to the theater. We can let them go back to work. So now in Scotland, our tactic, our strategy is to treat this with vaccination, with caution, so individuals still know that you might need to wear face coverings in some places, and to do surveillance. For a long time, scientists around the world have been preparing for the possibility of a pandemic caused by an unknown disease. This included work that we do at the University of Oxford, where we develop the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. As soon as COVID-19 began to spread, we recognised the severity of the situation and joined efforts to create a vaccine that could slow the spread of COVID and save lives. One of the most fundamental uh, things that we've been able to address during this pandemic has been the, the bit that comes first, the funding and the uh, paperwork that comes with setting up a trial for vaccines. So that has been really speeded up and the time taken for that has been really compressed. But the speed at which we've carried out the trials has been at the same pace as for other medicines. So actually that hasn't been faster. That's actually been at the same speed. Then the vaccine came out and the very people who were dying the most, you know, the black community, were the ones refusing the vaccine. <laughs> I'm like, how are we going to get around it? For everyone in Scotland over 16 years of age, uptake is, is actually lowest in the African ethnic group at 41.7%. Um, that compares with 75.4% in the white ethnic group. That is a massive 30 percentage point difference. And that difference is even greater if you look at uptake of four doses who've been offered to some of the people at most risk of severe disease. So for example, people over 75, there, there is a percentage difference of over 50 percentage points between the black Caribbean and African groups compared to the, the, the white groups. These aren't just numbers, these are real people and real people who are remaining unprotected against consequences that can really be very severe and have big impacts on lives. It was uh, very difficult to convince people to go ahead and take vaccines, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. just because too much information, too much untrusted information. It was a whole mix of a lot of things. It was mm -hmm. confusing. Plus, I believe, uh, fear mongering from the, the media. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every four o'clock, there's a report. A thousand people yeah. have died today of COVID. Yeah. 100,000 are yeah. infected, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and you're being bombarded by all these figures. It's the same COVID that's there now. Well, somebody, somebody will say that, oh, I went, I went to uh, take COVID, uh, COVID uh, version, but when I came back, they started barking like a dog. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I had a mixture of people who had a massive amount of misinformation, real information, and also seeing the experience of their colleagues or friends or family who were at the front line and just realizing the difference in terms of the equal opportunity or you know experience and the impact that it was having in a community in real time. There was lots of information, some conflicting information as well, lots of conflicting information. There was fear, you yeah. know. A lot of people were not sure who to trust or what to trust in. People get their information from different places. They have many different reasons for vaccine hesitancy. And sadly, Many of them were not really about legitimate medical concerns regarding the speed of it or the long-term effects. 
meant much of the vaccine hesitancy, unfortunately, comes from lies. There are a lot of people out there, a lot of powerful cohorts out there, who are deliberately and maliciously spreading misinformation and disinformation. Understandably, people pick that up, think it's credible, and act on it. I, I personally was someone who was not going to get it. And my husband had to get it first because he, was, he works in the healthcare sector. And uh, I, said to, I kept saying to him, don't go, don't go, don't go. And he was getting pressure from me. He was getting pressure for, from his mom in Africa. It's like, don't go, don't go. So he went ahead and do it. And when he came back, I said, can you say Jesus? Because <laughs> <laughs> in my mind, I was thinking, this is, you know, you know what people have been saying about this thing. So I was into the conspiracy theories and all that. So for me, I was like, this is the beast. If you get it, you are denying Christ and everything. This is what some people believe in. The conspiracy people, mm -hmm. there's a government saying stuff. There's people giving their opinions. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's the relig religious aspect. Mm -hmm. And it was all about, especially for black people, there's like, do we trust? Who do, Who we, do we trust? Who do we trust? Yeah. yeah. Who do we trust? There are two types for me of vaccine hesitancy. There's vaccine hesitancy where people are worried about taking a new medicine, which I think is n normal and should be discussed carefully. And then there's, um, there's the conspiracy theory sort of s people. And... The thing that concerns me about that is that there's a lot of money in it. So there's investment and there's investment in um, providing treatments to people who, which are ineffective. And that upsets me because um, it, it can have, it can actually, that can kill you. So vaccine misinformation can kill you. Once you're in the grip of a conspiracy theory, then it, it's kind of, it's too late then. We need to get people before they're in the grip of a conspiracy theory. That's the thing about the intellectual virtues. They they help you to never get into that state in the first place. Because once you're into that, the problem with being in that state is whatever evidence you're given becomes itself like part of the conspiracy. So you're you're in a, you're in a kind of hole now. You can't even listen to the evidence. So when I saw that he was okay, when my letter came, I didn't have a choice. I just thought I'm gonna go. If there wasn't like those appointments being sent, and this guinea pig in my house being okay. Trust me, I wasn't going to go for it. So I might be living in an environment that's bombarded with scientific testimony, where all of my colleagues and friends, all the people that I trust in everyday life, tell me that the, the vaccine is safe, that the research has been done properly, that that's the best thing to do, to take the vaccine. You know, my counterpart might be, you know, living in a completely different type of situation where, uh, you know, that they're, they're surrounded in their environment. There are no scientists. Uh, that that make this kind of testimony, and they're surrounded by people who tell them that it's a risky thing to do this vaccine because it hasn't been researched enough. So, and these people notice that they're going to be the people that they trust on an everyday basis. You're right to trust the people that you, you that care about you and you're close to. You're you're right to trust them. You know, as you say, they have your best interests at heart. The evidence has some credibility, um, but that doesn't mean you have to accept it hook, line, and sinker. Right? You can still you can still, you know, have a look at it, examine it, you know, talk about it, try and work out, right? So people had a reaction. How do they know it was the vaccine? You know, how do you know? Well, some people do have reactions. So how do we know that this is, you know, how do I know I'll have the, I have the reaction and so on? Vaccination is the greatest scientific development in 100 years. It actually saves your life. So if you choose not to have the vaccine, you are putting your life at risk. But worse than that, you're also putting other lives at risk. Now, that's a very blunt message. And some people don't like that message. I have had threats. I've had bad mail. I've had social media threats because of that message. That doesn't mean the message isn't true. The environment that the particular community in question uh, inhabits, and by environment, I mean, you know, evidential environment, the kind of evidence that they are presented with, uh, is such that it leads them to not be very you know, uh, kind of confident that taking up the vaccine is the best thing to do. I noticed during the COVID outbreak, a lot of Nigerians living in UK ask us to send some of these harbor materials to them, some of these harbor substance to them. And they were cooking it. They were sniffing uh, the steam from this harbor concussion. 
and they believe it protects them. So wherever they go, they go with their tradition and culture. And so, and, uh, of course, a lot of them were using it and they were sharing it on social media, how they were using it and how it was working for them. We were constantly drinking lemon, ginger and turmeric. That's the thing that I was adding, fresh turmeric, grated mm -hmm. in every single day, doing it by the dose. And people, people prefer this because they can relate with it. It's from the nature. It's from their community. It's from where else they can see. And so we are still talking about the same traditional bound practices. That is the same thing that is happening to an indigenous African community. This cannot be blaming individuals. This is about finding out the reasons for their decisions, where they get their information, so that they can explain to me, they can teach me, and we can do much better regarding micro-targeted campaigns to overcome the misinformation and disinformation mm. to admit legitimate concerns, because there are some. Is it your health? Why must I say, Father, please help me. I, I don't know want to be having this off and on. You know, my health has not been great. No, 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 no. Father, please help me concerning my health. You know, I've changed from one medication to another. But instead of getting better, it's getting worse. Faith and science, they are not conflicting, but they are working together. It is God that has released that knowledge yeah. and understanding and this breakthrough. God released it to people for, to do humanity good. There are some people who are working hard to bring wrong information to the public. And these are people who are crab pullers. These are people who are role mothers. They have like about millions of followers. Mm -hmm. And you've already told them, oh, Thank if you, you take God. this, mm -hmm. you are, you are, you've got C, 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 Mark here. Now that means you are a demon. <laughs> you understand that? It sinks to them. So you tell them, if you take, if you take that, you're not going to have that. You tell them, you tell that they have designed this for this kind of people. These are misinformation going out in numbers and coming out from prominent role models to people, millions of people are doing that. And I know how is that we don't eat foods. So people have the belief that the vaccine contains some gelatin from pigs. So they don't want to take it back because it's against the individual. At the beginning of the vaccination, the BAME community throughout the UK, we're not taking the vaccine. But the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, started engaging the key African leaders. And one of our leaders, one of our church leaders in London, you know, he had a meeting with them and he said, you know what? The only way you can push this vaccine to black community is if you walk through us. That's how this woman is going to take the vaccine. And what, what happened after? The church become a vaccination center. Can we trust the government? It was at the height of that whole John George Floyd yeah, episode. Yeah. So trusting the government was maybe not the first option for a lot of people. There's no meaningful engagement between the council and the black community. And when that happens, even when there's that information, you only go by what you can Google yourself on your phone. It's not that it's coming directly from the source of the council that you're in. It might be an information you, you know, that is going on in England, for example, or it's going on somewhere else in Scotland, which it might not be appropriate for your own council. So, so you go by that kind of information. So that, so that also affects um, the information you receive or that we receive as Black, um, as African community. We had situations where certain members within the sector of the powers that be, mm -hmm. not following their own... Uh, sort of following, not following their own advice and yeah. not sort of following the, the information that everyone else was supposed to follow. Fully understandably, lack of trust in certain governmental levels. Fully understandably, a lack of credibility in terms of who is telling us what to do. The prime minister broke his own law. Many other politicians from across the political spectrum were proven to have broken their own laws. This is not acceptable. When we are in a position of power and authority, when we recommend advice, and when we, in particular, implement legislation, we have to obey it.
so many people from a black African, you know, from BAME, some of them walk through the pandemic because yeah. they need to, you know, support their family. Um, they are not entitled to so many things. Why? Because maybe some of them, they are, on, they are still on visa yeah. and on their visa, no recourse to public fund. So they just said that, well, if I die, I die. I just need to, you know, provide for my family. So, you know, they were coerced to work mm -hmm. because they need to feed their family. And you're right. Some communities were more affected by that than others. And that, in the main, follows the inequalities in the country you happen to be in. That could be true in Indonesia, it could be true in Kenya, it could be true in England and Scotland. COVID exposes existing inequalities. It's not that COVID is a worse disease for Polish people or Scottish people. It's because it exposes the inequalities that already exist in your country. So then, over time, you have to think about what your policy and your strategy is going to be to mitigate those inequalities. When we look at different groups, we can look at collective characteristics and we can look at individual characteristics. So individual demographics are aspects like eye color, height, air color, pre-existing uh, medical conditions, and certainly ethnicity, race, skin color, caste, as well as gender, sex, and sexuality, age. All of these aspects, and many more, feed into how we are healthy as individuals. Then there's a more collective aspects. What are our jobs? What food do we have access to? What can we afford? Are we in accommodation with a lot of mold, with a lot of dampness, with a lot of fungus? What is the density per household? Because the more people in a household, the more chance there is that a disease will spread among more people. And then how are people treated day to day? If you fear crime, walking to and from work and school. If you are targeted because people assume you're a certain ethnicity or nationality or sex or gender, that adds stress. That creates mental health and well-being problems. People are being discriminated in their places of work and you know it glaringly that this is discrimination. But, and they say, don't worry, we'll do something about it. What about do something about it? It's about them moving on the person, but they are not acknowledging that something is wrong. And when that is not done, it's like you covering a wound. You know, instead of treating it and making it to go away, well, you are covering it. You are sweeping things under the carpet. So at some point, it's going to come back to the surface again. Yeah, so, and that's why the issue of trust, and that is why people are very reluctant to take the vaccine because of this issue of broken trust. I guess there was less trust for me for in, in systems, in yeah. information, and also because I had just just about started a healthcare agency as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There was a lot of like inequalities in yeah. how black I'll speak for black people yeah. um, that I was trying to work with in those in those early days mm -hmm. going into work and being put at the forefront of mm -hmm. real like real life COVID. Yeah. And when they come back they tell you how different it is with their white colleagues and yeah. then you feel okay, are they putting you out there so you can as a shield sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. as a shield. So all these kind of things made yeah. you not to trust for the uh, African community, we w they were forced to accept the vaccine because of economic um, reason, because no job, no job. People can be asked about their vaccine status in order to assess risk about what they're going to do, but there is no mandatory vaccination in Scotland. So you don't get or lose or keep a job because of your vaccine status. Now, what we've decided in the Scottish government is, and our advice to the First Minister, was that we shouldn't mandate vaccine, we should persuade. We should use all of our communication powers, all of the science, to persuade people to come forward and be vaccinated. And in the main, that has worked really, really well. We have very, very high numbers and percentages of people who are vaccinated. But mandation is not part of our policy. I know many people that took, those, that took the first dose, in particular, of the vaccine, that they, if they had the time, 
they would have processed it in a different way. Maybe they will still take the vaccine eventually, but because they don't want to lose their job because of the social factor that we mentioned, the socioeconomic factor that we mentioned before now, because they know if they don't work, there's nothing coming to the family. They know if they don't work, they have no access to uh, public fund because they are not British, you know, if you are not British, you don't have access. So they know all that. So they have to work. On the surface, whilst it looks like the government was well in control of getting people vaccinated, there was this whole net of people underground mm -hmm. who don't have access to GPs mm -hmm. who couldn't get the vaccine anyway. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking in terms of COVID being a public health risk, I feel like the government really failed. Mm -hmm. Where, where that's concerned. And yes, there's all this anti-migrant rhetoric going around, but mm -hmm. I feel like that doesn't help when we then have circumstances of public health and everybody's threatened. It, it actually doesn't matter whether you want foreigners in this country or not. Mm -hmm. uh, when people have to harbor illnesses and diseases and, and, and potential COVID, mm -hmm because they just can't go to a GP and, and say, right, I'm over here, whether or not I'm legal in the country is a totally different thing, but we're here because we need to get rid of COVID or whatnot. Then, you know, it's, it's, it's like doing a circle on yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Taking one step forward, two steps back, like in essence, then nothing is solved. And I mean, even now we're talking of Rwanda, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. people just people go to Rwanda. Yeah. People just go further underground. You know, if, if, if you're, if you're worried about being found out mm -hmm. by going to register at a GP, mm -hmm. just so you can take a vaccine, then imagine having COVID and then worrying about being found out and then worrying about possibly being, being sent off to Rwanda yeah. and whatnot, you know, like, I, I just feel like public health, COVID and all of that shouldn't impact people that are bound by immigration. It's really about giving the treatment and giving everybody access to the treatment, giving everybody access to vaccines. And within that respect, that was a huge, huge problem, especially within the niche mm -hmm. that I work in. Nobody would be reported to anybody else. Your personal health data is private. It belongs to you. And that's why we ran drop-in clinics. Not, not everybody got a letter. In fact, I went to a drop-in clinic to have my first vaccine. I didn't have my vaccine because of an appointment that was sent to me. We wanted to keep a record of the vaccine so we would know which vaccine to give them next time. So we would know when they were due their next vaccine. So it was important to keep records. But at no time would that be shared with anybody else. And you did not need to be registered with a GP to get your vaccine. You could turn up at a vaccine centre, and you could still do that today to receive your vaccine. But my other advice is to be registered with a GP because it's very important for you and your family to receive that broad health care, not just vaccination. But if your kid gets sick or you get sick, then the UK system works because of access to general practitioners. And that's not a home office matter at all. People are showing it to me that I'm not part of this community. And sometimes when you go to, to places, you know, you are being isolated. People don't want to speak to you. These are the things that our people, they've gone through. And they just believe that government is there. They are not doing anything about this. Even in the government, who are, making, who are the people that are making decisions? They are making decisions for themselves, not for us, because the proportion of Africa, Afro-Caribbean people is not much in the government, in the trade unions, in our societies. So they just believe that, no, we cannot trust them because they don't even know where we are coming from. They don't even know our cultural background. How would they make decisions for us? And that is why people don't trust the government. In the end, the decisions are made by the first minister and the cabinet of the country. That's who makes the decision because they are the elected leaders of our nation. And in the UK decisions, not so much our COVID strategy, but let's say the funding strategy, they are made by the UK government, the prime minister and his cabinet. Now, the advisors around them are hundreds and thousands of different individuals. There are a few of us who are in the room with them. 
And then beyond that, there are Public Health Scotland, there is the UK Health, Health uh, Protection Agency. There's a series of kind of circles out from them who engage with communities all the time, who try and hear from voices from the faith and belief sector, from the hospitality sector, from the business owner community, from ethnically diverse groups. And I, I tried to do as much of that as I could during COVID. In the end, the small room advises the first minister what to do and the first minister and her cabinet decide what to do. Now you might not like that, but that's democracy. That's the, the way to change that level of representation is voting. You do make a good point though about who is in the circles and, and we should include. So, so we, we did that and we did that with the African Caribbean community. We did it with young people. We did it with older people. So we tried our best because if you're the national clinical director, there's only one of me. So you, so you, can't, have, you can't have every ethnicity represented in the one individual. So my, my job is to try and hear from those voices as much as I can, take those voices and, and, and give that advice to the First Minister. Now, if people don't trust the government, then they should look to other sources of information to do that. But I don't know what on earth I would gain by not telling the truth. Everything we're doing is to try and prevent disease from COVID and harm because we've seen too many people die. A lot of people are worried about the after effects of taking the vaccines or even COVID itself. What has it done to us? So the first time I was supposed to go, I was unwell. The second time I was unwell. So it turned out I didn't go in the end, mm -hmm. right? But the judgment, mm -hmm. yeah, the That's judgment correct. was just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I took the first one. The next thing looks as if one part of my body was paralyzed. The first uh, dose. So then I took the second one, and they said, oh, you, maybe you didn't take paracetamol, you have to take something, pain class before you go. I did that. I took the second one, it was okay. But then I took the boost, all the, my body system, sick. I said, what was all this? Well, you said when we take this thing, it will help us. <laughs> Instead, I'm sick. You know, the experience was, wasn't really easy, to be frank. And though they are still now, we are hearing another one coming again. Well, me, I'm not taking any more. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> I've taken three. I'm okay with that. I think people were not getting questions answered about the side effects of this thing. If you've had the first one and you've had a bad reaction to it and your doctor cannot explain to you what's going on, mm -hmm. the chances of you getting the next and the third are very low. Yeah. 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 And, and even from the way I was speaking earlier, you could probably tell I haven't had it because I was asking questions nobody could answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so I even joined some closed groups on Facebook of people who didn't want to join. Yeah. And people have different reasons for not wanting yeah. it. The side effects that, that people get generally are a bit of a sore arm, maybe feeling a bit feverish um, for a day or two afterwards and a bit of a headache, um, easily resolvable with a couple of paracetamol tablets. That, compared with the risk of developing severe pneumonia in an intensive care admission, is, is for me, a risk worth taking. But everyone makes their own decisions about, about uh, these things. We, we wouldn't want to force medicines on anyone. There is no evidence that COVID-19 vaccines work differently in people of different ethnicities. All COVID vaccines used in the UK are highly effective in people from different ethnic groups. This is important as severe COVID disproportionately affects individuals from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds. In the trials for the AstraZeneca vaccine, we intentionally included people from diverse backgrounds to make sure the vaccine was safe and effective for everyone. I can tell you with absolute certainty that your risk is higher of a blood clot if you catch COVID than if you have the vaccine for certain. So COVID is the higher risk for all of these things. There are a lot of conspiracy, some real, about what the vaccine does. So the vaccine in the main makes you feel a bit tired, 
might, might make you be, feel a bit feverish for a couple of days. And the vast majority of people get better after two or three days because it is not the virus. It's pretending to be the virus in order for your body to respond. When we give a vaccine, you're actually, you're, you're creating effectively natural immunity as well. All you're doing is exposing, instead of exposing you to the whole virus particle, we just take a little bit of it. But almost all vaccines are based on the spike protein. And our bodies think that we've been infected when they see the spike protein and they, they produce natural immunity um, with antibodies against that spike protein. If you rely on natural immunity, it means that you're exposing yourself to the whole virus particle. And um, that, that comes with the risk of severe illness. Obviously, I was in the US when this happened, so it, it, uh, different experiences might be in, in Britain. It was, science reporting was different, but uh, over here, one thing that was interesting was that uh, there wasn't that much reporting about how taking the vaccines, the, the immediate side effects you could get. You know, I think a lot of people were very surprised. I mean, I remember, I think it was the second one I had, was I was very ill for like you know, 48 hours, and quite a lot of people had, had that. And I remember anyone telling me, you know, you're going to be very ill. You know, I mean, that might be a problem of sort of, uh, of science not being, you know, as forthcoming as it should be about how, you know, what effects you might get. There could be political reasons for that. You know, you want to encourage vaccine take up, so you play down the side effects. But, but I, I think in general, that's not, a, that's not a good strategy. I think science should be open, right? And it should say, and, and, and usually it is. Usually the, these decisions aren't made by the scientists. They're made by the, the politicians. I do read scientific papers, I'm sure you do. They're very precise, very specific. And I'm sure, you know, when they report on these vaccines, they're very specific about side effects and so on. I do understand vaccine hesitancy and the sort of um, feeling that people have that they don't necessarily want to take a new medicine. Nobody wants to take medicines anyway. We wouldn't be throwing a vaccine at people if we didn't think it was in their best interests. There are almost no long-term complications to the COVID vaccine and all of them are much, much less common than they are if you catch COVID. There was a specific challenge right at the beginning with allergy, because some people are allergic to some of the elements. And we had, a, we had a couple of incidents right at the beginning of people having severe allergic reaction. And we adjusted protocols and we adjusted which vaccine for which people. And then there's been some reports of blood clots, particularly in young men with one of the vaccine manufacturers and in young people particularly. So that's why we, again, we adjusted which vaccines we were giving to which age groups. And there's been nothing else really of much consequence. We've now given billions of doses of this drug across the world, billions. And we monitor it all the time, regularly. And the Joint Committee on Vaccination continues to believe that this is a very, very safe vaccine, particularly when you compare it to, to the disease it's preventing. So the first thing that needs to be done is we need to look into the reason why uh, people reject vaccines, the reason behind evidence rejection, as it were. Is it the, the kind of situation that I described where people who reject this evidence are inhabiting a particular kind of environment where it is perfectly justified for them to reject it because the evidence that they have suggests that vaccines are not a good thing because they're just surrounded uh, by, inform by evidence that seems to suggest that. Uh, which may well be misleading, but that's what they've got to go on, right? If we are dealing with a widespread uh, lack of justification, so with widespread irrational belief formation, that's actually much harder to deal with. Part of the solution is educate the intellectual virtues, help people to think more clearly for themselves. And then also, I think, you know, be more honest about what science is and what it offers. You know, so a lot of conspiracy theories, I think they, they, get, a, they get some mileage from the fact if they think science is sort of presenting itself as settled, mm. settled fact about things where the facts aren't settled, you know, and then that, that can give a lot of um, fuel to conspiracy mm. theory. There are studies that show that cognitive flexibility training is good for this. Cognitive flexibility is um, the disposition, people's disposition to be kind of open-minded to various, to different actions, to different beliefs, to what other people think. So it's, a, it's an open-minded net open-mindedness about changing course of action, changing beliefs, right? So 
you know, a cognitively flexible person doesn't stick to their plan stubbornly if evidence shows up that it's best to go in a different direction. What we did in Nigeria was to not just encourage people, not just telling people to take the vaccine. What we do is to make people who take the vaccine, people who are major stakeholders in among the community to let people see because most of the times when the earth workers just jump on a population, they don't know you from anywhere and they are not likely to trust you. If you say it on, on social media, on every, they, they may not trust you. But when you have people within the community, being the advocates, being the mobilizers, making them to see in their own understanding, then it helps a lot. The advice is work in a community. The advice is actually come come in and work alongside and communicate in you know we can support you in terms of communicating the information and really support people to have their ownership of the choice that they make especially regarding um, what they put into their bodies and people are going to come around to understanding okay this is actually something that's going to work for me but you need to work with a community rather than talk at people and throw sort of information at them you have to work with the community, reach people. What I feel should happen is um, enough information should be out there in language that people understand, understand. Mm -hmm. so that they can make their own choice. If you like, if you've got the money, put it in, in people's languages, in mm -hmm. Punjab, yeah, in, in yeah. Somali, in Swahili, or mm -hmm. in Shana, or, you know, people need to understand in their own language and be able to decipher what's going mm -hmm. on in their own language. We are foreign at the end of the day. If we're talking about black people, let's talk about information that's relevant to us specifically. To black yeah. people. The health issues that affect us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How we, how, what we need to know about those conditions and how COVID will impact them. Mm -hmm. You know, like you mentioned, HIV, diabetes obesity all those things yeah, like people know. need to know these know. things yeah you know it and can't just be blanket information and properly everybody. research some of the gps they need to watch the way they deal with people from the african community mm. i mean how about a gp that will be talking to me and the way he talks is just like you're gonna die if you don't do this you die and you know it's like cut down <laughs> You know, don't, don't oh say God. like he, and, you know, oh and, you know, and with that alone, and the impact of that is, the GPs, maybe they don't know, as a community, we talk to ourselves, especially when we use your GP, mm -hmm. and that will make many people not to come back, especially yeah. if they are getting that same doctor when they go for the GP. If people don't know the systems, they'll, they'll not engage, they'll miss out on things that they should be able to benefit from because they don't know. So what are the services, the authorities out there doing to reach out to us? Because we miss out on things that are, are there for us. And you know, there's this thing about if you don't ask, you don't get. You don't ask because you don't know it's there. For health inequality purposes, like we've approached like NHS Lothian, we're here, we're not hard to reach. Mm -hmm. We're working with people who um, have, you know, long-term health, they'll not look at us because we're a small organization mm -hmm. somewhere, somewhere. You know, they've already got other organizations that they're working with and stuff like that. So it's kind of like, how do we profile ourselves for the good work that we do, um, especially when it comes to health inequalities? What I, what I will say is that nobody should suffer public health harm because of income or inequality. That would be my advice. Now, how that then translates into the government's policies in whatever country you happen to be in is a matter for elected officials, not a matter for advisors. The advisors advise, the politicians decide. So you're right, there were gaps in some of those processes. And from a public health perspective, that's bad. That, that should be corrected. But how that's corrected and who's to blame for UK government, Scottish government, all of that, that's a matter for elected officials, not for me. But I would like to see um, the a government address the poverty thing. It's serious even amongst black people, especially. Even the people who are in poverty at the moment, we, we have skills, we have things, we have ideas, we have, we have training, we have education, but we're just not getting opportunities. Even though I'm just, I have so much experience, I'm still undermined. Something needs to be done about employment in the African community. 
you know, we have people who are qualified for positions. They are not getting it. We can't even get the reasons why they are not getting it. We have to think about what can we do yeah. to help our own communities. We organize a lot of seminars within the churches. What are the concerns? Because people have valid concerns. So it's not just saying people are dying, you have to take the vaccine. <laughs> it's about what are you worried about? Let's talk mm. about the issues. Unfortunately, there's no guarantee that the next variant, and there will be a next variant for sure, will not be a more severe variant. And so it is important to be vaccinated. I would advise people who are hesitant about it to engage in a conversation with someone who's got the time to have a chat with them about what the risks and benefits are. And with any medicine we prescribe for any patient, there are risks and benefits. But, but this one, is it really for me is a no brainer. You know, we have a virus circulating, which can be very severe, particularly in older people. So if everybody took up their offer of vaccine, whether it's their first dose, their second dose, their third or more dose, that would make a massive difference. That is the key to protecting ourselves. It's the key to protecting our loved ones. It's the key to protecting our communities. And it's the key for us all to be able to move on with the way of life and, and, and how we want to live. We, we are willing to help. We are willing to you know, cascade this information to the congregation and they are willing to listen to us. The congregation are willing to listen because why we have built that trust. We are family. So we listen to each other. We look at it together. We listen to their concern and we can bring back their concern to the local community, to the uh, government. So this is what our people are saying. What can, what can we do? How can, what can we do about this? How can we help people?
While we started development of the vaccine in early 2020, it wasn't until later in the year that we partnered with AstraZeneca. They covered many of our costs, however AstraZeneca don't employ or pay the staff involved. AstraZeneca also pledged to make the vaccine available on a not-for-profit basis throughout the pandemic and even afterwards for low-income countries. At the University of Oxford, we have been working on vaccines for over 20 years against a wide variety of diseases, including MERS, another coronavirus similar to COVID-19. Part of this work also included developing the new adenovirus vector CHADOX-1 that the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is based on. Once the virus causing COVID-19 was identified, we could create the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine by inserting its genetic sequence into the adenovirus vector we had previously developed. Since then, the vaccine has been distributed to over 180 countries globally. None of the approved COVID-19 vaccines contain ingredients at levels which can cause harm or are unsafe. The vaccines used in the UK don't contain any live SARS-CoV-2 virus and can't give you COVID. Other myths circulating include that COVID vaccines contain trackers or microchips, or that the genetic information in the vaccines can alter your DNA. This isn't true for any COVID vaccine. All vaccines must go through several different stages of rigorous testing to make sure that they are safe before they are given to the public. To be used in the UK, vaccines must be approved by the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency the MHRA, who ensure the safety of all medical products. The MHRA have assessed all safety information for the Pfizer, Moderna and AstraZeneca vaccines, including data from thousands of participants from vaccine trials. Even once approved, vaccines continue to be monitored for safety. Trials for all three of the vaccines currently used in the UK have intentionally recruited people from diverse communities. For example, trials for the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine included people from many different countries, including South Africa, Brazil and Kenya. As variation between people such as age, sex and ethnicity can affect responses to medical treatments, it is important to have people from diverse backgrounds participate in clinical trials. As evidence shows that individuals of certain ethnic backgrounds are at higher risk of severe illness from COVID, it is particularly important to know that the vaccines work for these groups. At the moment, it's hard to say how long we will be protected for by these vaccines. Studies so far show that protection lasts for at least six months, but ongoing testing is required to see how long our immunity will last after this. Booster doses can help us keep our immunity levels high and protect us for longer as they remind our immune systems how to respond to COVID. To make sure you're protected for as long as possible, it's important to be fully vaccinated and to take up any boosters that you're eligible for. Unfortunately, no vaccine is ever 100% effective. Everyone's immune system responds slightly differently to vaccines and factors like age and underlying medical conditions can influence how you respond to a vaccine. Some people therefore wonder why they should get vaccinated, even if they might still get infected. Even if you still get infected with COVID-19, vaccines can help to reduce the severity of illness you experience and lower the chance of you ending up in hospital or dying from COVID. Even if you've had COVID-19 in the past, it's still important to get fully vaccinated. There is very strong evidence that people who have already been infected with COVID can become reinfected, particularly with the circulation of newer variants. Getting vaccinated is the best way to protect yourself from possible future reinfection, as this helps to boost any immunity you already have. If you choose not to get vaccinated, you are leaving yourself vulnerable. Currently, three different COVID-19 vaccines are used in the UK. Having multiple different vaccines available for the same disease is actually quite common. For example, this past year, six different flu vaccines were available in the UK. The COVID pandemic led to an international effort in vaccine development with separate groups working on vaccines. It was very important that teams focused on developing different vaccines to increase the chance of at least one of these vaccines being effective. 
We have been fortunate that many of these vaccines are highly effective against COVID and are now available worldwide. All three of the COVID-19 vaccines currently used in the UK are highly effective and give similar levels of protection against COVID. The main differences between these vaccines are the type of vaccines that they are and the way they work to give us protection. The Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines are mRNA-based vaccines, whereas the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine is a viral vectored vaccine. These are both relatively new vaccine technologies which provide our cells with the instructions to make harmless copies of the spike protein from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. However, the way that these vaccines provide these instructions is slightly different to each other. Our immune systems then recognise these harmless spike proteins which teaches our body how to respond to COVID. Giving multiple doses of a vaccine increases how effective a vaccine is at protecting us. In fact, most of the vaccines we receive throughout life will be given in multiple doses. Over time, our immunity may also begin to naturally fall from the last vaccination we had. Giving multiple doses of vaccine over time helps to keep our immunity levels as high as possible. There is no evidence to suggest that COVID-19 vaccines can affect fertility for either women or men. All data, including data on fertility, has been carefully assessed by the regulators who monitor the safety of vaccines in the UK. COVID vaccines are recommended to people who are currently trying to conceive or plan to do so in the future. There's also no need to avoid getting pregnant after getting vaccinated. Some anecdotal reports have been made of people experiencing alterations to their menstrual cycle following vaccination. However, studies have shown that any impact on the menstrual cycles is minor and temporary, and people should be reassured that there is no evidence to suggest that these changes will impact their future fertility. In the UK, COVID-19 vaccines are strongly recommended during pregnancy. This is because pregnant people are at higher risk of severe COVID and associated complications such as being admitted to hospital, requiring ventilatory support and undergoing preterm delivery. COVID vaccines have been given to over 264,000 pregnant people across the US and UK. There are no safety concerns associated with the use of these vaccines during pregnancy. When deciding to get vaccinated, some people are worried that a vaccine might overwhelm their immune system or affect the way in which their immune system can fight off diseases in the future. In fact, our immune systems are used to being constantly stimulated as we come into contact with hundreds of pathogens every day. Our immune system is vast and in one milliliter of our blood we have over a million immune cells so our bodies can easily respond to a vaccine without getting overwhelmed. Getting vaccinated improves your protection against COVID-19 and doesn't negatively impact your ability to fight off future infections. Compared to adults, children and young people have a lower risk of becoming seriously ill from COVID-19. However, some children can become seriously unwell. The virus can also spread quickly between children and young people, which can lead to children missing school or the virus being passed on to older or more vulnerable family members. Children with certain underlying health conditions or weakened immune systems are also at higher risk of severe COVID. For these reasons, it's important that all children are vaccinated when eligible. Most common prescription drugs for things like high blood pressure and diabetes don't interact with the immune system. These drugs work very differently to how vaccines work and they don't interfere with each other. In fact, it may be particularly important for people on these forms of medication to get vaccinated as conditions such as chronic heart disease and diabetes are known to be associated with a higher risk of severe COVID-19. Most people with allergies can safely have COVID-19 vaccines. Anaphylaxis, while very rare, has been reported in a small number of people following COVID vaccination. Although extremely rare as a safety precaution, vaccination staff are trained to quickly deal with any allergic reactions that may occur. However, anyone with a history of allergy to a component of a COVID vaccine shouldn't receive that vaccine unless under expert advice.
It is understandable why people have questions about COVID-19 vaccines, particularly given the amount of misinformation that has spread since the start of the pandemic. When doing your research, make sure you are looking at trusted sources, such as the World Health Organization or government health websites, such as the NHS. Talking to people you trust in your community who have decided to get vaccinated can also be invaluable. Ask them why they decided to get vaccinated as you may be able to relate to their reasons. If you're still unsure or have medical concerns, ask to speak with a healthcare professional. They can provide you with information and advice tailored specifically to you and your concerns.